Okay. Welcome. Hello. Uh, thank you for joining the third and final UX Design Industry Night panel. My name is Christina Fiedrich. I'm the Manager of Credential Programs here at Emily Carr uh, Continuing Studies. And Industry Nights offer recent graduates and current students of the User Experience Design Program valuable insights into industry as they start on new and exciting career paths. We also want to welcome members of the broader Emily Carr community who have joined us today and anybody else from the general public who might be joining us um, for tonight's panel. This event is hosted by Emily Carr Continuing Studies, and I'm joining you today from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Joining virtual events offers the opportunity for us to connect across many different traditional territories and lands. As a guest of this digitally mediated event, I encourage you to also take a moment to acknowledge the land on which you live and where you are joining from today. Breaking into UX can be both challenging and rewarding. Today, you will hear from junior designers and alumni of the program who followed different paths and applied their skills to find success. Whether developing and refining a portfolio, applying for internships and jobs, participating in hackathons or founding their own companies, our panelists tonight will be sharing their insights and journeys into the UX industry. I would like to welcome Juliet Fajardo, Mackenzie Mischke, Nicole Waldron, and Jared Zeckel. We're gonna start off with each panelist introducing themselves and then move into general questions we've prepared. If members of the audience have questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A window and we will allow time to bring these to the panel for responses. To get us started tonight, I'm going to pass it over to Juliette. Okay, hi everybody. I'm really excited. I think uh, this is amazing. Uh, I'm sad that I didn't do this when I was changing careers, but I'm so happy that I can really provide my experience to new designers. Um, so, oh, sorry, oh, what, here, okay, perfect. So, uh, my name is Juliet, and if you see an H, it's a silent H, I'm from Colombia, so the H is silent. Uh, I'm a queer Colombian woman. Uh, I've been living in Canada for the last 13 years. I worked for IRCC uh, in the public sector in the transformation wing as a UX designer. Uh, maybe something a little more about me. Uh, I have worked in retail for the last 10 years. Uh, I had lived in four different countries and I have two passion projects that are all about uh, to empower people, inspire people through photojournalism. So mostly athletes and motorcyclists. I do run a motorcycle, so that's why. Uh, and then a big one, why did I end up choosing UX design? So I was in a point in my life that uh, I needed a career that used my strengths and passion. I wanna find a career that allowed me to grow and get new challenges. I want to find a workplace that looked me in a holistic way. Uh, I was definitely ready for a change and then in the right mind space to do it. And looking for a place to empower others, like a career that allowed me to do that. Uh, something else about me, maybe uh, some values that I live the life by. And, I want to start saying, why did I share this? This was one of the most important things when I changed careers that determined where I wanted to be and when I wanted to go. So I have adaptability, authenticity, connection, growth, and leadership. And to just finalize, I just want to tell you a little bit about my UX-related project. So Cherry and Tech is a tech squad. I'm a the senior designer there. Uh, it's a small group, so I can call myself like that. Uh, ADP Liz, uh, I mentorship. I have a YouTube channel in Spanish about changing careers in your late 30s. And I have a UX uh, postcast too that is uh, to be new into UX design. So that's me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll pass it on to Mackenzie next. 
That was a great presentation. I don't have a presentation, but I'm also excited to be here. And I'm super stoked that Emily Carr's continuing study program still did something, even though we're all virtual. Um, I think it's important as the recent grads of this program, I really uh, loved that experience with the industry nights. But more about myself, um, I started off actually as a psych undergrad and graduated with a psych degree, but before even graduating was like, I don't want to do, I don't want to counsel. This is not going to happen. <laughs> um, so I found my way into a startup because everybody's hiring at startups, but I actually ended up in sales and I hated sales, it turns out. But again, I, I guess I'm, what I'm trying to describe is my very unclear path towards design. Um, but yeah, so while I was there, I was exposed to product design and developers. So I started to think about, oh, this is like super cool and interesting. Why have I never thought about this? I've always loved graphic design. I've always loved people. I just went one way versus going the other way, but maybe this is the time. Um, so I quit after two months. Uh, I ended up at Emily Carr's program, um, cried while we, while we tried to learn coding, but loved the design work. <laughs> um, and then um, found myself uh, graduated and looking for a job. Um, networking is everything. I happened to uh, be painting houses to make ends meet before finding a job in UX. And one of the contractors on my job site um, had a brother-in-law who actually was one of the founders of Turtle Design Agency here in Vancouver. So I met with him and I was offered an internship and that's how everything moved forward. So um, two and a half years later, I was still there. Uh, got to work super closely with super senior designers, which is like an invaluable experience. There was only about eight of us by the time I left. So it was just a really intimate setting to learn what I loved and didn't love so much about design and where I wanted to go next. And now I work in-house at a startup called Legible or e-reading platform. So if anyone's interested in e-reading, go sign up, a little plug. Um, but yeah. Um, so now I'm learning what I love about in-house. It's a lot more in-depth I'm finding than the agency work I've done in the past. Um, that's a very quick meandering introduction about how I got into design. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, how about Nicole next? Hi, everyone. I'm also a fellow alumni of Emily Carr. Uh, it's great to be back and to kind of support the program and see all the students here. It's, I always find it super inspiring. Um, so if you ever want to reach out and ask questions separately, I'll always feel free. Um, but about my journey, um, I kind of got it started within a technical degree. So I came from a very technical family. My mom took computer science degree. My dad took a computer science degree and so did my sister. Um, so that was kind of the path that I was just like somewhat bred for. And then I went in that direction as I kind of got to the point of my degree where I had to get into an internship and start looking at jobs. I, I was able to land a really cool position at SAP uh, in kind of like data and visualization, but kind of working more so on the back end kind of database stuff, et cetera. And I definitely was not passionate about it. So I was trying to find ways that I could like navigate that towards the items within our team that I was kind of more intrigued by. So that turned out to be more of like data visualization and talking with our internal clients and, and kind of figuring out what their pain points were and how we could kind of solve those. So I felt I was like naturally going towards that direction. And then I was lucky to be able to participate in a really cool um, two day long design thinking workshop that SAP hosts. They call it their like intrapreneurship workshop. So they kind of bring everyone together and problem solve for two days straight. It's a really kind of intense two days, but it's really fun. It's kind of like the design thinking version of a hackathon. Um, and that's where I was like, wow, this is really, really cool. How can I do this more? Um, and that's what drove me to go back to school right after I finished school. So that's when I got to Emily Carr and took the, the interaction design program and, and kind of combined my technical experience with the user experience side and brought that together. And that actually led me into kind of being in a product role. Um, so I started out in a product role at a company called XSAM that made academic dental software. 
Um, so they didn't necessarily have a lot of design or user experience happening at the company when I got there. Um, so my role uh, was kind of bringing that to the company. So kind of looking at how we could problem solve and bring more of that process and, and thinking behind uh, user-centered design and bringing the user to the forefront of our decision-making um, and kind of, kind of for, you know, got that rolling and, and happening at the, at the whole company. And it was a really positive experience because it led me to having a new kind of dedicated role position um, kind of created for me at a new startup. So, so that led in a really cool direction. And then at the, the startup I was hired for, I had a, a role created for me and it, it's kind of blossomed from there, but that I've kind of continued in that direction of just always proving the value of user experience design and, and the process and, and research and data behind it as well. Thank you so much, Nicole. So maybe fewer tiers for the coding course in your case? Exactly. That one was easy for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, great, already done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everybody has things that are that come easy more easily than others. So right. for, exactly. I was I was crying when everyone was so good at the design side. I, like, <laughs> I don't know if this is for me. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing both of your tiers. Um, I think that's very important. Um, and not as a segue, but uh, we'll now uh, skip to Jared, if you would like to <laughs> provide your introduction. All right, sounds good. Uh, Jared, I, um, I've been working in the industry for about three years now. Uh, like everyone else here, uh, alumni of Emily Carr. Um, and also like everyone else here, I had a very interesting journey into UX, um, uh, worked lots of different jobs and different career paths uh, in service industry um, and film um, and uh, attempted entrepreneurship. Uh, the way I started in UX was I was building and prototyping uh, physical products, uh, industrial design, as many of you know it. Um, and so during that process, uh, you know, you're kind of a one person army, you're trying to do everything. Um, and so, you know, building a website was one of those things. And uh, at the end of the day, I found out that I really enjoyed working in a digital medium. Um, it was much more satisfying and uh, to be completely honest, much cheaper than, um, you know, paying for 3D printed pieces all day. Um, and yeah, so after I would found the, uh, I was originally going to go into the inter- um, sorry, the uh, industrial design program at Emily Carr, and I found the interaction design program. I didn't even realize that this was a thing that existed. Um, and I'm very happy that I went into it. Uh, it's been a life-changing experience. Um, it's been a career that I never realized I could have, and it's something that I do every day, and I still love going in every day. Um, I got my first job at a company, local company called EventBase. Um, they do large-scale, you know, 50,000 people events. Um, obviously took a real tough uh, turn for the worst during the pandemic, you know, having 50,000 people in a room together, not the greatest idea. Um, and yeah, so I started as a UI designer there um, and slowly worked up to a product designer. Um, and currently I'm working at a company called Rise People where we do payroll, HR and benefit software all wrapped into one. Um, so my day to day is mostly working on the design system, building and maintaining that as well as uh, working on some projects that harmonize products across our, sorry, across our platform. So that's me. Great, thank you so much everybody for those introductions. It's a great place for us to get started on some general questions, um, but I also have a couple of uh, notes that maybe we can just kick off to start with. Um, so Nicole, you mentioned, um, you know, the, the opportunity for you to basically create or have new positions created for you in these environments that maybe UX was never considered as a role. Um, have you found that that is something that uh, was an exciting opportunity or has it been challenging to kind of convince a company that this is a role or um, a service or um, experience that would be helpful to bring to the company? Definitely. Um, I would say it's been a bit of both. I think 
the environment and the willingness for people to kind of take that information in uh, really affects that experience as well. I know um, at the first company I kind of worked at, which is Exan, um, it was really helpful that I had kind of the support and trust of the leadership team to really help get that ball rolling. Um, they did have one designer there who wasn't necessarily using um, UX processes, but kind of the designer was really excited to kind of get into the UX side of things too. So there's just a lot of kind of positive momentum happening, um, which really helped make my job a lot easier. Um, so I think I think there's always going to be challenges, but getting that that stakeholder adoption um, is one of the biggest pieces. Uh, if you have a stakeholder who's just not interested at all, um, then that's going to make it quite a bit of a challenge. Thanks, Nicole. Do, do any of the other panelists have any experience with being able to sort of carve out uh, a new role in a company or um, any similar types of experience that they want to share? Um, I think I wanted to add something about Nicole. I haven't had that experience yet, but uh, working for the government, what are we doing is really out of the box that is really not like new. So in that first beginning of what we're doing in, in this product is how we making sure that that data stakeholder believe what we're saying. So we do, we did a lot of workshops. We did a lot of one-on-ones and I think building that uh, communication and that trust between the stakeholders and the design team and they can see that we really care about the user, but we want to bring the business to, in, of course, 100%. Uh, I think that brings us like a big window for people to understand who we are and that what we want. So for, uh, for me, I will say we are bringing uh, what is design thinking into the government. So maybe a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um... There's somebody else named Christina who's joining. How interesting. <laughs> um, I'll just keep going with some of our questions. Um, so this is a general question for everybody on the panel. Uh, so UX design is a broad discipline. Um, there are UX and UI designers, product designers, UX researchers, UX writers, and so on and so forth. Um, how did you determine the direction of your career uh, to target your job search? when you were starting out. Jared, do you wanna do you wanna start us off? Oh, Mackenzie, you had your hand up. <laughs> Take it away, Mackenzie. Um yeah, I actually so this question is interesting because I found it easier to um remove things I didn't want to, I knew I didn't want to do, especially as a designer who doesn't have like um career experience when you're just starting out, it's really hard to know what that day to day actually looks like. But I did know the things I like to do. I really liked UX processes, as well as um, visual, but I wasn't super keen on visual. So I was like, okay, I'll start leaning towards UX. I know I don't like coding. I know I don't like UX writing um, and like strict research. So I don't want to do those things. So that kind of helped guide was eliminating options, basically. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I'll jump in as well. Um, I think that's a really good point that you made uh, by eliminating the, the options that you don't want. Cause I think I've always kind of had a few different titles where I'm like, I could fit into these types of roles. And I think especially uh, first starting out, it was more so I know um, I'm not necessarily adept at the design side quite as much as others might be. Um, so that's why I fell into more of a product analyst role. Um, not because I wasn't interested in UX titles or UX roles, but more specifically because I was looking more for like user research. And especially at the time, uh, there weren't that many of those roles available. Um, so I was kind of looking at how, how like my expertise and what I learned from Emily Carr really fit into the specific um, needs of the job postings that were available at the time. I can go. It's like, are we, are we looking at each other? Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so I was going to say, I'm not an Emily Carr um, alumni. So 
So I come from the bootcamp uh, background. And I think for me, I always got so scared when recruiters or people ask me about this, like, what do you want to specialize in? Like, I don't know, I just finished school. So uh, and I think uh, when Mackenzie, you were saying like, what are my strengths? And definitely what is not something that I'm not good at it. So again, English is my second language. So definitely nothing that it has to be with writing is <laughs> not my strength. Um, but I was finding what is some of the skills that I have from my past experience that I really can bring over and that are going to be definitely miss my strength. And that is going to be my differentiation between other people that haven't maybe have that much ex work experience as me. So working for me in retail, I'm doing a solution problem every second in a bit. Uh, like I know how to do process, like I can put them into practice. I can do a lot of A-B testing. Um, so uh, how I can use my communication skills to, to be a be a good UX designer. So I've, I feel like at the beginning, and I still consider myself a unicorn, really my strengths go into communication uh, pieces and tools and how to be adaptable to change. Um, I don't know if that is enough, but I'm a unicorn still at the moment. Yeah, um, <clears throat> kind of, uh, you know, breaking into the industry when you have zero tech experiences is uh, extremely challenging. I'm not going to lie to anybody uh, here. Um, and so similar to Mackenzie, obviously, there's, there's the things that you definitely don't want to be doing. Um, for me, that was writing, not a good writer. Um, but for me, I also recognize that you're going to, if you cast a wider net, you're going to get a much better, you know, more opportunities are going to come your way. Um, and for my situation, that kind of worked. I, I think most, you'll find that most positions will be doing a little bit of everything, especially on like lean startups. You're going to be doing like six different jobs a bit of writing, a bit of research, a bit of uh, UI, a bit of UX. Um, and so, you mean, after a few months or years of working in the industry, you might even realize that you wanted to do a direction that was completely different from the one that you originally sought out. Um, so, I mean, if you have a good manager, and hopefully you do in the, uh, in the future, um, they will 100% help you carve out a direction that you want to um, be working in. Um, and, you know, also doing a little bit of everything uh, is going to help you when you finally do get to narrow down your, your kind of job, because um, you kind of understand each role and how they interact with your role a little bit better than, you know, when you've just kind of started out of school. Um, so I think uh, for me personally, it just worked better. Just cast a wide net, see what comes my way. And uh, I also had like $400 in my bank account. By the time I got a job, I was, I was next to broke. So uh, I didn't really have much time to be picky and choosy. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jared. Um, I think this kind of uh, folds nicely into another question that I have for everybody. Um, how closely does your current position or your current title even, uh, or day-to-day -day experience match your expectations when you first started your UX journey? Um, I can go. Um, I think I was so excited. Um, I finished uh, the boot camp and it's like, they say that I will get a job right away. That is so easy, but I have to remember that it was COVID time, so the jobs were limited to. Um, so I needed to find some experience without working. So I ended up doing some passion projects on the side with developers and project managers that were in the same shoes as me. So we start creating little things that's cherry on tech today. Uh, so for me, I was really excited to realize that what I learned at school it was so useful and hands-on in what I was doing uh, with my uh, tech squad at the moment. And I think when I started working, I realized that that little experience that I have in the tech squad have helped me so much to develop that skills that I had at the boot camp. Uh, beside, of course, learning on the side, reaching out, going to conferences. Uh, and I think that's 
really for me it was a lot of what else can I do on the side to bring that experience to life but honestly I I do everything that I learned at school at work that is for me amazing uh so useful definitely you don't go in in depth it as you want to know in, in in the learning but for me is amazing that I can use every single skill that I learned yeah Um, I'll jump in as well. Thanks, Julia. I I think that for myself at the moment, working at a startup, uh, it goes kind of day to day. Um, sometimes I'll be like, yep, this is super in line with what I plan to do. Other days I'm, you know, writing a blog and I'm wondering why I'm doing that. So, <laughs> so it really goes kind of back and forth um, with expectations. But I guess for myself, I, I knew working at a startup was going to kind of get get me into working on a whole bunch of different projects, which I actually really like the, the kind of dynamic work environment of having exposure to those different types. I think that's really helping me kind of build my portfolio of skill set um, to, to showcase like, wow, I can apply these processes in so many different areas, whether it's communication design or whether it's looking at product features or whether it's looking at uh, solving a problem like user onboarding and user learning of the product too. So it's it's really helped to kind of expose me to those different areas. But if I, if I kind of looked back to where I was when I first ended Emily Carr, it's definitely not what I would have first hoped for myself, but I, I wouldn't have wanted anything different now. Yeah, uh, I'll piggyback on that. It's it's interesting with my first job out of the Emily Carr program at Turtle, it was dead on what I thought it would be. Um, but as your seniority grows um, and your experience grows, of course, you start taking on different um, roles and maybe going towards more working as more like managerial roles or things like that. Um, but to speak to what Nicole was saying about a startup culture, you very much are taking on a lot of different things. Um, you can be helping with, you know, pro, like defining process of how your team actually works internally. Um, but I have loved how close, like UX is just so practical. UX UI design is so practical. You're actually doing that work if, if that's gonna be what you're going towards. Yeah, um, out of school, I assumed that I was going to be spending most of my time doing card sorting exercises and making logos. Um, I don't think I've made a single logo to date, and I'm pretty happy with that uh, as of now. Um, in my first role as a UI designer, I, I did none of that stuff. Uh, I was mostly creating mockups with client assets, and I was doing a lot of work with Xcode and Android Studio, so vastly different from what we learned in school. Um, and then when I moved into product design um, at the, the first company, um, there was a lot less research involved than what I expected. Um, in my current role, uh, there is much heavier focus on research, which I, I certainly appreciate. Um, so, you know, every company is going to be different. Um, every role is going to be different. Uh, it's all contextual. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think change adapt and continue learning with the company, but you can also influence how they uh, do things. You know, if you think it's important to um, do a certain sort of exercise to, or, or tests or use uh, even um, specific programs and technology like Maze or Figma, like whatever kind of design tools you like to use, um, absolutely like throw your weight around and, and, and kind of not demand, but uh, influence what your company does. Thanks everyone. That actually came up uh, at yesterday's panel, uh, which was talking about internships and interviews. Um, was this this idea that you know you have to not be afraid to ask for what it is that you want um, to either identify like I'm really enjoying working here. How do I get a permanent role? Or I would really enjoy working on this project. Or you know trying something new. So have have you um, generally as a panel, you collectively um, have had those experiences where you've been able to kind of make those requests and sort of ask to be able to participate in a way that maybe you weren't uh, originally intended to participate or hired to work on a project? And how, how was that experience for you? Uh, 
I can go. I can go. <laughs> um, so I, I think for me, because I was brand new into UX design and brand new into like tech, into public sector, I think it was just so much at the beginning for me to kind of take in. But again, I knew what I was good at. I think again, for me, it was a lot of still learning about UX. So how can I use my strengths and what I've been good for a long time that I can really use that at, at my current job. So um, I created, for example, how we are going to communicate with developers. So I did a workshop about design thinking and developer hands off, like uh, hand off. Uh, that was a good one. I do a lot of like, uh, communication between teams, how to make the team have fun. For me, I feel like if the team is engaged and the team is having a good time and I understand who you are and how do you like to communicate, this process is going to help so much when we are in a sprinting and when we are having one-on-ones. Um, so for me, I think that's something that I have included that maybe is not that much UX related, but it's more about soft skills and communication. Yeah, I find, um, I don't know if it's just the industry we're in and there's a lot of uh, startups and smaller companies. There are massive companies too, though. So what am I saying? But I've ended up in in smaller companies um, where it is a lot easier to to carve your own path and talk to your managers about what you want to do. Um, so that's something to consider too. And when you're looking for your first job, um, if you don't know what you want 100% do, maybe look in that direction. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think from my perspective, um, I've probably been in a lot of unique scenarios where it's really about pinpointing what's not working well and kind of um, spearheading the problem fixes for that because, uh, you know, I learned very quickly that if I'm not going to do it, then likely no one is. So kind of just taking ownership of those problems that I'm discovering and 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 really finding ways to to make them them happen in terms of finding solutions for them. So I think that that's really important. If you find pieces of work that you're really passionate about, kind of make prove that value of it and make that project happen for yourself. Because um, if you're not doing it, uh, it, it might not be done. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, there's lots of opportunities uh, to kind of, you don't have to be pushy, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, if, if something's not working for you, it's a problem. You know, you're a designer, you should be working on problems on the product. You can also be working on problems in your day-to-day -day workspace. What's the solution? You know, you don't need a, an HR moderator to figure out um, that you don't like doing something very much and you can work with your managers and with your teammates to improve it. You know, whether it means that you, um, you know, maybe you have to do stuff outside of your job description or um, just maybe take some time after work to really kind of discover what the solution is. Um, it's uh, there's plenty of opportunities to to you know first of all have a conversation, but then also like come up with ideas and and solutions and documentation to, to kind of work out some sort of process that uh, everyone wins. Thank you so much. Um... I think also if you're finding problems in systems or processes, the likelihood is that other people have probably run up against the same problems and might not have the capacity or the time or the energy to try to think of solutions or may not have the tools yet uh, to kind of come up with those solutions. So this is something, you know, like I think in Nicole's case, um, we were talking about that earlier, you know, bringing design thinking to a team or UX design to a team that had never thought about it before or didn't know how to implement it before. So um, yeah, kind of in the same thread of like, if you have a question, other people have a question in, in the same room. So just don't be afraid to, to jump in there. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for your thoughts on this. Um, 
going to move on to another question. We have some questions in the Q&A. We will get to those um, in a little bit, but um, just to keep going with some of the general questions we had prepared. Um, so a portfolio is something that a lot of students really focus a lot of time and energy in uh, creating and completing um, before they finish the program or at the end of the program. And it really should be considered a work in progress. Um, so how often did you update your portfolios or change your portfolios while you were searching for a job? I can start with that one. Um, so I think one of the decisions I decided to make after I had first finished at Emily Carr was to completely redo my portfolio because I learned so much while I was there, but I was rushing so much to get kind of deadlines made. And I wanted to really make sure that my portfolio was showcasing the best of my abilities. So I, I took what I had I had learned from that process of making a website that I wasn't completely happy with uh, and completely re redid it. Um, I was lucky to kind of have the time and, and, and whatnot to do that, but it really, really helped kind of push things forward. I, I've got to say that it was not ready when I first got my first job. So it's something that uh, needs to kind of be from my opinion, worked on continuously. If you if you let it fall off, which I've definitely done in the past, it kind of leads to leads to having to rush when you get to that point of wanting to look for a job again. Um, and then it's a lot of work, and it can be a little bit overwhelming and intimidating if you feel like you've got ten projects that you want to add to your portfolio or whatever it happens to be. Um, so I'd say the more you can kind of continuously check back in, take a look at at how your website's performing and how, how your overall structure is of the portfolio and how it aligns with what your project is doing. And, you know, maybe maybe checking in with your current goals versus what they were a year ago. Um, Cause that for me has kind of changed continuously as well. Um, has would probably be the advice that I'd give myself if I was looking back to. Um, oh, Jared, are you going to go there? No. Nope. Um, I hesitate to speak towards this because I have a very neglected portfolio. Um, <laughs> I see some other people nodding. Um, yeah, same thing. It was super rushed by the end of the program, and I was lucky enough to find a position quite quickly. Um, but uh, my biggest advice around a portfolio is really don't fixate on it and don't think it's what's going to get you the job. It might get you the interview, it might get you the initial meeting, but it's better to, as Nicole was saying, just keep working at it and keep applying while you're working at it before you perfect it. Because I can tell you now, I don't have an online portfolio, but I do have this Figma file that I send people that I update uh, specifically to wherever I'm applying to. And that works great too. Um, so it's, yeah. Adaptability is probably better than perfectionism for that. I think I was feeling, I feel the same as Mackenzie. It's like, please do not ask this question because um, I haven't done anything with my portfolio since I finished school and I'm still not proud about it. Um, but a big one for me there is like, we finish school again, I need a grade, they are good, I send it to people. And at that point, I didn't have that as much experience to show off. And, and I feel because I was rushing, it's still not showing my whole skills. So I took a different road. I, I feel like, what are my strengths? Is my portfolio and resume my strengths? They're not. Honestly, I took more of my time of networking, uh, different ways, um, connecting with people genuinely. And I think all the interviews that I got honestly were because of networking. So I was using my strength that is connecting with people and realizing that that's what you are going to get. You're not going to get the whole Juliet in my portfolio, but you get the whole Juliet talking to me. So I, I, I knew that was my strength. So that's what I use. Um, and the same as Mackenzie, if I knew that I was applying for X job that I was looking for X skills, I will try to bring that out of my case studies and bring it into a special portfolio for the interview that I, or for the job that I was applying. So I was trying to be again, um, 
be unique and special for that job application. Yeah, um, <clears throat> in terms of portfolios, I, 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 yeah, Sam, no, nothing, nothing. It's it's all trash. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's never finished. Uh, creative people have this uh, innate sickness uh, that nothing is ever finished. Um, there's always room for improvement, editing, a complete overhaul. You put the finishing touch on something and two weeks later, you come back and say, this is horrible. I want to redo it. Um, so, you know, you can't overthink it. And sometimes it's good to just take a step back and let it breathe. Um, you know, from my perspective, simplicity is key in a portfolio. Like really define your problem statements, uh, word your solutions in a clear and understandable manner. Um, give brief summaries of features and list out really good success metrics. Um, if you don't have, you know, a, if it hasn't actually been like a built product, um, you know, you can use, uh, you know, maybe test data from um, prototypes or, you know, even at a minimum, some ways to, you expect to measure success um, out of your projects. Um, but I think a lot of things that I initially thought of that needed to be in a portfolio, um, you know, like research, like, like 13 paragraphs of, of my entire process and reachers, it's somewhat superfluous. It's not necessary. It, it's good to have that um, available when people ask, um, but, you know, design leads are busy they're going to be reading through dozens and dozens of portfolios um, when they're thinking about hiring. So it's unlikely that they're going to be skipping through all, all, 10, all, all 10 paragraphs. So um, again, simplicity is key, but always have that research on hand. Um, and even if you have it in maybe like a, a separate page or file, um, that's always handy as well. Totally. I think to your point, I think one of the most successful things I've seen when looking at other designers work and, and hiring, et cetera, having a really succinct kind of summary and something that's really quickly viewable um, just makes it that much easier when you're going through a lot of applications as well. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, something I actually want to come back to that most of you mentioned and is likely the case for a lot of folks who are joining either a boot camp or a short term program or, you know, wanting to change their careers is that we all have a life that happened before we made that decision to go back to school and, and change directions. So you know, in Mackenzie's case, there's a whole degree in psychology. Uh, Nicole, you have the background in tech and, and computer science. And Jared, there's the entrepreneurship and industrial design. And, you know, we, we've got uh, like Juliet as well, like the, the retail experience and working with people and connecting with people. So what would you say is like a, a way that you used that experience to leverage yourself you know, if we if we exclude the portfolio and, you know, trying to refine this to be a perfect sort of artifact of what we just learned, how did you use that previous experience to kind of help bolster yourself uh, when you went into those interviews or tried to highlight your skills to uh, a hiring panel or a, one individual person? I'm going to stop rambling there and just leave that hanging for somebody to pick up. <laughs> I, I can go back a little bit of about the values uh, that I listed at the beginning. Definitely, uh, they have moved to something different as today, because at that point, I think um, I was driven about uh, having a new career and meeting and networking and meeting people. But I think at the moment, in the moment that I realized that my experience, because you finish whatever school and you're ready to find a job and no one is like, we don't like you you are not enough and you feel sad and depressed and i mean it happens to absolutely everybody um is looking the point is you realize what is my values what do i what is my unique strength that's that's how kind of call it and i think when i start changing that mindset into uh, i'm enough uh, and i start bringing everything that i've been working so hard about it uh for example, for me, for the job that I have right now, being an immigrant is such a plus for what I do. Uh, I've been being in the uh, immigration process for, I don't know, I did it for seven years. And the project that I'm working right now is so close to my heart. It's like, 
is amazing. It's, I'm always so excited about what I'm doing. Uh, but again, finding a job that is uh, making my strengths like explode and people is like, yeah, we want you. I think that was for me a big step in finding and telling people what I want. I want this type of job. This is what I'm looking for. Uh, because of course, it's stressful when you're looking for a job and you're new to say what you want. Uh, but at the same point, I was going away from retail because there were a lot of things that I didn't like. So for me, it didn't make sense to jump in the same thing because it's a new career. Uh, definitely, I have the privilege to have six months, a little more, of being um, able to not to work and definitely network and concentrate in my career. I think that's a big plus definitely that I had. Uh, but for me, it's like, how do I start putting my strengths, my passions together and telling people what I like? I told absolutely everybody about what Juliet was looking. Juliet is looking for UX design, my mom, my grandpa, like everybody know what is UX design because I wanted everybody to know. And like, that's definitely how I call people calling me and finding jobs is like, hey, we have Juliet, she's pretty cool why don't you hire her? So, uh, I mean, you use what you have uh, and I think just go for it. Yes. Yes. Yeah, totally. Um, I feel on a similar vein, networking was drilled into me from an early age. Um, so, you know, it was easy to sell my, my undergrad degree in psychology um, as far as understanding research and having that motivation to understand users um, and translate that to design. But a really, really corny reason why I got my first job is because somebody I worked with in-house painting who referred me basically said I was a hard worker. So this is like the dad moment of the evening. Any job you're doing, show up. <laughs> you just got to show up and try to do your best. Um, and this also ties into networking. You do not know who you talk to, who will lead to your next job. So just as Juliet said, put it out there. <laughs> yeah, I feel so similar to, I think um, probably one of the best decisions I made looking back was asking different people within the company to be mentors for me. Um, so, so even, once I got to a point where I was at a company, I hadn't necessarily um, done a lot of networking at the point in time because I was kind of thrown into an internship, which was um, an assignment of my school. Um, but kind of going that route of getting a lot of different perspectives and mentorship within the company can really help you refine um, what you want your own plans to be for the future too. Um, and also kind of looking at um, different perspectives. But if you take that outside of before you're actually at a company, I think um, that that networking is so important um, and and kind of making those links is everything. The, the community in Vancouver is, we're lucky to have a large tech community, but it's smaller than you think. Um, everyone tends to kind of know each other. Uh, so it really, really helps to kind of make those connections. Yeah, I, I can um, say that uh, working in the service industry, you know, waiting on tables, you're, you're having, uh, you know, 60 different conversations a night with completely different people, strangers that, you know, you have to find common ground, um, you know, other than what are you having for dinner? Like, you know, you gotta schmooze them a bit and ask them what they're doing. And so that definitely um, played a huge part uh, in, my, you know, my career and going into interviews and finding common ground and just, you know, um, people want to hire people that they want to work with. It's as simple as that. You can be the best worker, but if you're you're kind of a, a dolt or something, uh, you know, you might have a tough time getting over the line. Um, so just, I mean, it, it's personability doesn't always come as first nature. Uh, it definitely took me a while to learn. Uh, when I was in high school, I was sheepish, and that kid who stood in the corner. Um, and even now, uh, networking is 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 tough. I still don't find it comfortable. It's hard kind of reaching out. Um, and to what Nicole was saying about the community in Vancouver, um, people here are great. Um, they want to nurture um, talent. Um, 
And so don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, and, and same, I think uh, Nicole might have mentioned this before. Um, you know, after the session, you're more than welcome to contact me on LinkedIn. I'll be happy to, you know, critique your portfolio or even just answer any more questions you have after this. I think most people in the industry are as well. So feel confident and don't be shy to just reach out because most people are going to want to help you. It's actually um, just speaking of like the, the uh, small community, you know, uh, that everybody kind of knows everybody else in this community in Vancouver. I think there's been at least one person, if not more, per panel who's worked at some point at SAP. Uh, so that, that's just been sort of like an unintentional theme of this series of panels. It's like, oh yeah, I started as a, with an internship at SAP and I was like, check. Okay. <laughs> so, um, definitely that, that interconnectivity, um, and reaching out into the community and asking for what it is that you need and for those connections to come back to you. Um, you know, that's been, uh, from my perspective, also reaching out into an industry that I'm not actually a part of um, and making, you know, literally hundreds of connections with people. I mean, that's how I connected with Juliet. I mean, I know all three of the other folks on this panel because uh, I met you through this program. Um, and, uh, but, you know, like those, you never know where those go, um, where those connections go and where they might end up and how they can come back to you and what you can also offer back in return. So um, yeah, nurturing a community is, is a really important part of this. Um, great, okay, next question. I'm just mindful of the time here. Um, and I wanted, to, I wanted to ask Juliet actually a question uh, directly. Um, so your UX Untamed podcast uh, centers on the experience of starting on a new career path. Uh, what have been some of the greatest lessons uh, when speaking with guests and how has that helped you on your path? Um, yeah, I think we started the podcast because we were, again, sad. No one is calling you. No one wants to hire me. And we, like, we wanted to make sure that our audience is like the people who is hiring it, these companies saying, hey, Juliet really care about this. This Look what she's doing. I think that was our first intention. But at the same time, we wanted to know what the people who is on UX already have a, a longer experience than I have. what are they living and what do you expect in a job in different environments in different industry sizes. So for us, I think it was that it was just less connect to people, less show older people who is studying what it feels like, what can you learn? And for me, it was a great starting point with people who say, hey, yeah, I have a podcast about UX. Would you like to talk in our podcast? And I've been having the chance to talk to so many people. Uh, I'm the one who who go once and one to see if the person will be uh, fun enough for us to bring it into the podcast. Uh, so I feel like for me, it's been a great experience just to, uh, again, networking and learn from people and saying to people, I do love what I'm doing. I'm passionate about it and uh, I'm ready for the change and hire me. And, and I think it worked. Yeah. Thanks so much, Juliet. Everybody should uh, should follow uh, Juliet's podcast, Untamed or UX Untamed, um, and you'll get lots more information and hear a lot more about what uh, Juliet has been up to and who she's been talking to. So definitely give that a follow. There's another little plug for you, uh, Juliet. Um, so a question for Mac: um, You joined Turtle Design as an intern. Um, after graduating, and you stayed with them for two years, as you mentioned. What were some of the benefits for you when you stayed and grew with the team? Yeah, great question. Um, so getting hired on as an intern, um, it, it was great because again, like I was saying previously, I got to work with three really senior designers and I was one of their first employees. Um, and then it was cool to grow with them and watch them hire other designers um, and be able to work with them as one of their like 
first people in defining how they want the team to look and grow and what we should expect as their employees. So it, it helped me learn how to advocate my, for myself as an uh, employee. So this isn't even talking about design, but um, that was a benefit of staying and growing with the team. And then just getting to work, um, this more speaks to how small it was, but just getting to work on so many different things and um, try out more visually focused design um, projects, more UX design projects, um, and then being able to present to clients directly on, like, which is rare as a junior, I would say. Um, yeah, as far as other comment to that, I think that's kind of it. Um, the, the, I can't speak more highly about Turtle. They, they were great mentors and they really had my back as a baby designer coming in and trying to work me up towards more intermediate levels. So. Nice, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna actually switch over to some of the questions in the Q&A. Um, so we have one question that is about uh, routes for uh, like paths that a person can take who's actually working a full-time job. So um, as we know, the full-time certificates or the boot camps are full-time intensive. So it's very challenging, if not impossible, to have both a full-time job and go to, full, go to uh, school full-time. So what would be, uh, from your perspectives now, uh, a, a good opportunity for somebody who needs to continue uh, working, but also wants to join a UX program or do UX uh, studies? Oh, that's, I think that's a good one. And, and I feel like this is, uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm older, uh, I know. Uh, and again, I'm doing my YouTube channel about changing careers in your late thirties, so you can imagine how old I am. And I just didn't want to uh, go for another two careers. I did that already on, when I was younger. Uh, so for me, it was at the point, maybe this is not what you are looking for. For me, it was at the point is like, I want to find if I like this, how I can know that I like this. And I will say there are so many um, organizations, uh, for example, for me, I will mention uh, WorkBC that helped me to pay my school and gave me allowance when I was working. So I feel like it's like, what else are you looking outside of uh, what is uh, the common, like, I don't know, asking for a bank for money or whatever it is, like, where else can you find this money for you to go to school and have the opportunity to be full-time and maybe have a part-time little something on the side. That's what I was doing, nothing crazy, but something that will allow me to eat <laughs> while, while I'm at school. So I will say, uh, Try to go creative. If not, it's like, um, who can you start talking with that tell you about UX design? I can tell mentorship, and then you get a little more familiar and see if you like it or not. Uh, do some inter uh, informational interviews. We is this really what you're going to like? How is to work in a day to day? So that would be my recommendation. Awesome. Yeah, I can't say I've ever been in that uh, situation myself, but I think if you're already in a position where you're kind of set on UX and UX design, and you know that that's a route you want to go in, I'd say kind of pinpointing uh, a route that works best for your schedule. Like, you know yourself best uh, if you're able to kind of do self-guided learning and there's a course that provides that that can be flexible outside of work, um, then maybe do your best to kind of uh, look up those those options or, or talk to people about who might have done something similar as well. Mac or Jared? Sure, I'll, I'll yes. jump. Yeah. yeah um, it, I think there's lots of, and I don't know for say, but I know I'm fairly certain a lot of the boot camps do do kind of evening school. Um, and if not, I know uh, Google has a, a self kind of directed learning course that a friend of mine has taken um, and he's quite enjoyed. Um, so there are opportunities out there. And again, it's kind of up to you. Um, if you feel like you can make it work with the full-time job, then I, I strongly suggest that you go for that. Um, and if you, um, want to focus all of your effort and time on doing UX, then 
by all means, that's, that's another route as well. And maybe doing a, a self-directed learning course like the one from Google um, might be a good kind of introduction. After doing that, you might realize, hey, this isn't for me, or maybe this is all that I ever want to do for the rest of my life. And that might make you, uh, might help with a different decision. Maybe you need to take out a loan or something. Um, but, uh, you know, highly recommend just learning for yourself and figuring it all out. Great, thank you. Um, we'll go on to another question that we have here. Um, other than attending class uh, and doing portfolio projects, how can someone prepare to be more competitive in the job search? Oh, I love this question uh, <laughs> uh, because it's something that uh, I think a lot of people struggle with. And I mean, again, we're coming out of a school without any experience and maybe we did a couple of hackathons here and there. But honestly, I never tell people that I did a hackathon because I didn't have the best experience or proving my worth when I was doing hackathons. So at least for me, it didn't work. Uh, but again, I think I'm going back to Cherry on Tech. Uh, there is a lot of people that is in the same shoes as us that are finishing a school, developers, project managers, all the designers. They're hungry for real experience, like that interaction of building something. So again, we talk about community, how we can reach the community and let, hey, this is what I'm building. Uh, we build products uh, that empower women and non-binary people. That's what I'm so excited about. So I found people that are excited about this. And this is amazing uh, because it's, you're not just building experience for real experience with developers and again, again, product managers, but you are building something that you are so proud and excited to research and excited to tell people. So for me, it's like, what are your passions land and how you can unite that with what you're just learning right now? Uh, so that's my fine community, fine other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, oh, sorry. <laughs> I think that's really great advice. Um, I, I would follow it myself as well. And um, I think being in the perspective of someone who is fresh out of school and, and doesn't have a lot of experience kind of really owning what your strengths are. So even though you don't have experience, you have experience in your projects and, and you, you can kind of hopefully tell where where those strengths lie when you're working within teams and when you're working on your individual projects as well. So kind of really pay close attention to that and, and take a lot of ownership about the skills that you know you are really good at and be proud of those because I think um, especially being fresh out of school, um, I know for myself, maybe being a woman probably ties into it a bit, but imposter syndrome is a real thing. Um, and, and people can kind of tell when you're not feeling confident and, and they kind of play off of that energy too. So I think the more you can be kind of confident of those skills that you've, you've really honed in and learned throughout the program, um, the more other people will believe it as well. Yeah, I feel like I don't have too much more to add that those two you didn't already say, but um, yeah, just you can even start networking now just to really drill that in is just get out there now and start talking to people, whether it's on LinkedIn or through uh, industry nights or anything like that. Um, and yeah, I don't uh, feel like you need to always be focusing on, on UX. Um, maybe try like looking through Craigslist and seeing what sort of little side gigs doing a logo or doing a, um, you know, little bits and bobs here and there. Um, and I know there's a huge thing in the community about not working for free. I think there's a, there's two sides to that coin. I don't think anyone should ever expect you to work for free. Um, but if you're offering your services to a friend or to a family member, say your friend opens a business and they need a website, um, I don't think it's unheard of to, to offer your services, um, especially if you're brand new out of school. Um, getting that kind of valuable experience working with a uh, actual client client um, is uh, but again, like if anyone pressures you to say, Hey, you're going to get great exposure from this, like tell them to, you know, screw off and pay you what you're worth. 
Um, sorry, can I add something to just Jared said? So I think for me, one was one of the best things that, that I could do. Uh, one of my friends back in home in Colombia put up a restaurant and of course COVID was coming in and they designed the website and I was checking it out. I was like, mm, can I give you some suggestions? So I think for me, uh, it was again, how I can uh, use the skills that I just learned how can empower my friend with the new business that is going through all of these uh, new things happening as a consultant. And that leads to, they ended up doing some changes to the website and it has worked so far, so well, so good. And a lot of people, I do photography on the side. Uh, so is uh, some of my friends is like, oh, can I get some portraits and say, sure, what are you using them for? And then they say, oh, for my website. I said, oh, okay, cool. Who is building your website? Uh, so that ended up being me. But I mean, I just, honestly, I don't know if I'm just like jumping to everything, but I just put myself out and I make sure that how can I use my skills to empower people that I do really care? These websites that I built, they are paying for. So at the end of the day, I'm making some money, learning, having real uh, stakeholder experience, clients changing their mind and wanting something more bigger and better. So anyway, always look for the people who love you that they're going to want it to help you at the end of the day too. Mm -hmm. Amazing advice. Thank you so much. Uh, another question from the Q&A. Uh, so somebody is asking, what did you like most about the Emily Carr program and or the boot camp program? So while you were in school, what was what was something that you really enjoyed about um, that experience? Um, I, I did like it, it was exciting to finally discover something that felt like it fit and um, the UX program at Emily Carr does a good job of exposing you to different aspects of what makes, I, I call product designer as like an all encompassing term, but that includes UX, UI research. Um, so it exposes, it does a good job of exposing you to all those different things. And they're, they're, some of them feel a little bit like nuggets, but it's still enough to understand what you're interested in. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would, probably echo that a little bit. Um, I think just the exposure to so many different pieces, whether it's learning how to build a website, learning how to design it properly uh, for the best user experience, learning the user-centered processes and, and how you can kind of workshop and collaborate on that together. I think kind of bringing all of those little pieces together into one is what really made it work for myself. Um, and on that note that, yeah, that was something I used fresh out of school too, is I, I didn't have a job right away. It took me a few months to get one and I was able to make some income just using that skill that I learned at Emily Carr to make websites for others too. Don't have much to add, yeah. Uh, I can confidently say that I've never enjoyed school up until Emily Carr. Um, I was never good at it. I was always kind of a goofball sitting in the back of the class, just doodling on the desks. Um, and so it was, it was quite, um, um, it just felt nice to, you know, enjoy a course, take a course where I felt like I was learning. I felt like I wanted to learn. Um, and that, uh, you know, the, the teachers were there to teach something that they wanted to teach, not just like the, the sad English teacher who's just, you know, there because it's a paycheck. Um, and yeah, I thought that uh, it was also just nice being in a, a small group of uh, like-minded individuals rather than, you know, a 35 person classroom. Um, so I, I quite enjoyed, uh, I guess, just the, the feeling of, of wanting to learn. I'm jealous about uh, you guys, uh, but I, I think Mackenzie, when you were talking about that you didn't like the coding side, it's like, oh, you know, I would have loved for me to know a little more of that right now, because definitely that's something that I struggle the most is like, not trying to guess what the developers really want are talking about, but really understand. Uh, but for me, the bootcamp, 
is intense. I felt like I, I knew that I was getting into that. I was starting from five to nine for three months, not stopping even weekends. Um, so again, I knew that I wanted something intense and something that let me know if I really like this. Uh, so for me, that was mostly the option that I took the boot camp for. Mm -hmm. Just to quickly add on that, it's fine that you brought that up because I was going to say as much as coding was difficult for me, it was absolutely essential. And I'd like, that was one of the program, or that was one of the reasons the Emily Carr program stood out to me was because it offered that. And I knew it would be hard, um, but it, it, especially with working with other designers who didn't necessarily get that exposure, there is that it's, it's, it's proven valuable for sure. Um, and I just also loved how to speak to what Jared said, I just loved how practical school finally was and how I could see such a tangible result um, and not just like English class writing an essay that's based, I don't know, on opinion, but <laughs> anyway. Essays. <laughs> no essays over here. <laughs> Amazing. Well, I, I have to say, you know, I definitely feel a little bit of relief to hear that you actually enjoyed the program uh, from the LAR perspective. You know, I was a little bit like, do I ask this question out loud? What happens if they're all like, this was the worst experience of my life? Um, so, phew, um, thank you so much for sharing that. And, you know, um, all, also, you know, definitely understanding the perspective of the challenge of committing to that intensity. Um, I mean, just going to school, period, is intense. Making that choice to go back to school is intense. Um, and then on top of that, you have this, you know, uh, quite literally like nine to nine, or maybe like even more than that, you're, you're spending all this time dedicated to it. But, um, you know, I, I wanted to bring this panel together to, to show that it does, and it can pay off. Um, and that it, uh, that it has a, a really exciting possibility for for people so thank you for sharing that um now i can now i can breathe okay uh, <laughs> so we have time for one more question um and i'm gonna throw this one out there uh it's asking about salaries for entry-level positions so this is a nice practical way to end our conversation today i think um so the question is what is a reasonable salary uh, as an entry-level ux designer and what city in canada do you think has the best ux job vacancy I really want to hear this from all of you. I'm, I'm not going to <laughs> say much. I'm afraid what you all was going to say, so I'm I'm listening. Oh, that's a, such a hard question to answer because it's it depends on startup, agency, big company, big corporation. Um, but I'll just speak to my experience. Um, I think I started around 55,000 for uh, at, an, at a very small agency. Um, you have to consider living wage as well. I would say don't go like if possible, don't go below 50,000. Um, but that's it's hard to say. Um, and this was three and a half years ago. So it may maybe it's higher now. That would be great. Um, there was something else I was going to say that I completely forgot. Oh, as far as cities, I have no idea. I've only ever stayed in Vancouver, so I don't know. <laughs> um, I'll jump in too. Yeah, I think I think it can be highly dependent on you know the size of the company you're working for, whether you're doing an internship or getting more of like a junior position, uh, and what that happens to look like. But I would say, kind of know the company, do do your research when you're applying to. Um, Glassdoor is really, really helpful for kind of getting an understanding of some salaries that you can expect. Um, so that's probably what, where I would first go to look myself if I was curious to know more about what they offer. Um, and I know for myself, a, a starting salary was around 60,000. Um, but unless you're doing an internship, always, always ask for more. Know your worth. Once they decide um, that they want you, they want you. So. So make sure that you kind of ask for a more, more, even if it's just a little bit more, um, <laughs> do whatever you're most comfortable with, but um, make sure you're kind of putting that out there too. 
Yeah, I uh, I started at uh, 50 50,000 um, as a UI designer. Um, I think typically UI designers seem to be uh, slightly lower than say UX or product designer. Um, but again, do your research. Uh, there's it's it's a wide wide scale, um, and like you know, uh, everyone said so far, it's it's wildly different based on uh, each company that you're going to uh, apply for. Um, Again, don't get bullied into thinking that it's the only offer you're ever going to receive. If someone's trying to undercut you real hard, uh, first of all, um, like Nicole said, ask for more, push back. They're expecting it. Um, <laughs> red flag, exactly, Mackenzie. Um, yeah, they're expecting it for you to, to ask for more. Um, and so don't, uh, and, and don't think that, uh, it's it's just like fair because you're you're new to the industry. You you deserve what you deserve, um, and so again, I think like uh, to echo Mackenzie, you don't need to go under fifty k. That's probably a, a very minimum starting salary, um, depending on what you're doing. Uh, and then yeah, if, as terms of cities, um, again, only been in Vancouver. Uh, I hear Toronto is quite bustling. Um, so those are probably the two. Um, biggest tech centers in Canada that you'll find. Um, ooh, okay, okay, I don't feel too bad. <laughs> now, okay, I feel like I can say something. Um, I think something that I have in consideration, at least uh, for myself when I was looking for a job, again, it was like retail life and work balance is horrible. Yes, I, I think I was sick for a long time. And, and I think I didn't have chance to uh, do a stuff that I really like. So when I was looking for definitely for my new job, I was uh, putting a lot of things that I am passionate about. So for me, that was one of the things that I was looking for that this first job offered me uh, that I could use everything that Juliet is not just the limited part of UX, but everything. Uh, so is there. Uh, definitely, I talked to different people in the public sector. Uh, for me, I didn't know that the public sector does UX, but they do. And, and it's a, in a lot of UX designer and different options. So I think for me, I look at that too and compare what we're doing at, at uh, we are called Journey Labs for IRCC. So uh, I think that there's not much wriggling room in the public sector for how much to us, I think is the brackets are really sad. Uh, so for us, we're starting between like 61 to 65, depending uh, as an entry level. Uh, so I don't feel too bad. Uh, and I think uh, the work-life balance that I have is dreamy. Uh, I have never had this much uh, flexibility, uh, people that really care about me. So I was looking for something else that I will pile up in that money that I don't have. Uh, but it's like, what is the company of the organization giving me in a back that I can really work with? Thank you everybody for sharing your salaries, um, <laughs> all this personal information. Um, thank you so much for your transparency. Thank you so much for everything you've shared uh, this evening with our audience. Um, and thank you especially for your time and energy in giving back to this community. Um, so that is all the time we have uh, this evening. And um, thank you so much. It's much appreciated. And I hope everybody has a lovely evening. Um, and I hope we see each other again very soon. So. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Great to meet everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Bye.